Hi, my name is Michael Wong. Um, I am going to give a talk, um, this booth talk, on the parallel STL for C++ standards, which we have extended for CPU and GPU programming. And it's essentially is talking, pointing us in the direction of the future distributed and heterogeneous computing for C++. Okay. Um, there's a bunch of acknowledgments. We're going to skip past some of these things, um, the, usual, the usual stuff. So I, I want to give a little bit about the history of Parallel STL, which is Parallel Standard Template Library in the C++ standard. I'm going to talk a bit about what changed um, from the technical specification to having it in C++ 17, and how to do it for CPUs, which is what Parallel STL was meant for. And then finally, we wanna, we're going to try to do it and show how it's done on GPUs as well too, which is kind of what we're all kind of interested in these days. And I want to compare the results and show you what the results look like between CPUs and GPU. I have a bit of a spelling mistake there. So C++ 17 added parallel STL. And this is something we've always wanted, even coming out of C++ 11. We wanted the template, standard template library to run, in, to run and execute in parallel. Um, C++ 11 added the basic threads capability, but none of the library was accelerated to parallelism. That's kind of... Um, that's kind of just we ran out of time. <laughs> we didn't, it's not like we didn't want to do it. So what we did was that um, there was a technical specification built up for many companies. Um, and most of it has to do with the fact that there's a recognition. And C++ sometimes comes a little late on some of these things. That CPU cores are, are executing in parallel these days. Um, so starting early on... Um, there was a collaboration between uh, NVIDIA's Thrust, um, along with the Microsoft um, Parallel Pattern Library with the Intel thread build, um, the, the thread building blocks to build up a, a, a set of algorithms that would could, that could be executed in parallel. Now, clearly, not all algorithm, not all C++ algorithm can execute in parallel. We know that. We also had contributions from AMP and, to some extent, from AMD's Bolt. And then over time we develop a proposal called the Parallel Algorithm Library. And then continuing on with that, there was a lot of iterations, um, different vendors and different um, um, contributors were added until we got to um, 20, early 2016, where we finally had a large um, a set of corrections and the proposal to inject it into C++ 17. Now, there's a lot of changes, and I don't, I don't expect everyone to exactly understand it. I was deeply involved in it because I work in the parallelism libraries. Um, so something called dynamic execution was dropped. What that meant is that you can now no longer put the execution policy into a variable and then change that variable during runtime. There's a whole bunch of other changes. I'm not going to go through them all because you really have to understand these things about execution policies. And, 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 and things like that to understand it. The interesting thing that I would point out is that the, um, the, the, the way it handles exception changed from the technical specification to the C++ 17. The technical specification had this exception list of exception pointers, okay, which turned out we thought to be too complicated for the users to have. To, to, to have. If, imagine if you have an exception in a parallel environment. It would issue thousands, thousands of exceptions along every thread. And this would be essentially uh, the universe of all exceptions. Um, some people have implemented, Coldplay actually implemented it in our sickle. Um, I believe um, Louisiana State University's HPX actually implemented, but no one else actually implemented that. It was considered too unwieldy. At the last moment, it was essentially dropped and replace with just terminate and, and, and don't unwind. The idea there is that we're gonna put in a better exception handling mechanism. And, and indeed, in the last C++ standard meeting, which, which was just last week in Albuquerque, just up down the road, I put in a new proposal in, where instead of take, giving you the entire universe of exception, we give you the other end, which is the limited set of the first end exception that fits into a static buffer. So the idea there is that the question there is that while both proposals are interesting, what is the direct, what is the real, the, the, the ideal space to be in? How much exceptions do we want? We know we don't want all exceptions, but do we want just a limited set of first exceptions that comes out or something in between? And that discussion is still continuing on in the standard level. There are a few other things, but I won't go too much into them. Um, the, the real thing is that 
C++ standard only really understands CPUs right now. There's a flat memory address space, CPU only. So as such, even though we everyone want to, wants this stuff to work on GPUs, the rule really only talks about CPUs. So that's not bad. It's just a, it's a good beginning. But what we do have is we can do things like sort using um, a standard template library now. And it's a pretty simple idea. Um, indeed, I would say of all the C++ 17 feature, I think this particular feature is the most useful in terms of the fact that you can get 20 to 40% speed up with just adding a single parameter to the beginning of your STL algorithm. You start with, so your normal STL algorithm looks like this. There's always a begin and end. By the way, ranges is gonna change that, okay? But let's stay with this right now. Um, if you want to make it execute in parallel, you just add an execution policy, what I talked about before, for par, for par. Okay, and that means that it's going to try to execute this in parallel in an un, in an unsequenced manner. Okay, um, there are other ones that you can do. So, I talked about execution policy. The C++ standard has now started um, enumerating more and more execution policy, and it started basically with these three. Later on, when vectors and SIMD is going to be accepted, they're going to add more execution policy. And so we're not going to talk about that yet. The simple ones are the sequential execution policy. This is as if you didn't put any parameter in. Okay, this is the old C++ 11, 14, the way it works. It, gives, it doesn't do it in parallel. It's sequence in order execution in a single thread. Okay? And we have the parallel, parallel execution policy, which is called PAR. And you can use the call, so you can have the call thread, um, but the, it might span other threads. And that the invocations will not interleave on a single thread, but they're unordered in other threads. At a higher level, okay, this is, is, this is aimed towards um, vectors and GP, vectors and SIMDs. It gives you what's called a par parallel unsequenced. Okay, this is what is going to cause interleaving as well on a single thread. Okay. Now, you might ask, well, what happened if my hardware doesn't support this? What's going to happen is that the software is going to keep defaulting back down, or in this case, back up. So if you can't support parallel and vectorized execution, as in this par unsequence, it's going to try. It's going to go down to parallel. And if that doesn't work, it's going to go back to sequential, which is what you would have anyway. Okay? Um, there are actually lots of implementations. Good news. As I, as I said, a lot of this is based on a lot of existing knowledge. Even though some of these implementations were aimed for GPUs, um, specifically NVIDIA one and the CodePlay one, many of these other ones are aimed specifically for CPU, or in the case of HPX, it's, it's aimed for distributed node computing. Okay? So as far as I know, I don't think Clang has one yet. Um, so using the execution policy, I think I already talked about that, in addition to the three standard ones, you can also have your own custom execution policy. Here's the loophole. This is where SQL, which is a heterogeneous modern C++ language, has a SQL execution policy that enables you the loophole to get outside of the standard. This is important for a lot of things. It has to do with the fact that, well, these three have some pretty strict progress, forward progress guarantees. Okay. These forward progress guarantees essentially prevents them from executing on GPUs, even if you could. Even if you could. Okay. So with a sickle vendor policy, now you can actually have a forward progress guarantee that's very weak, which enables uh, GPU execution to progress okay, unblocked. This is an important point. All right. Um, how do you propagate the execution um, policy to the end users? Um, it's pretty simple. Um, you just send, you just essentially um, put it in as a particular um, um, parameter, and it will, it will be, it will be, it will be fine. Um, so you could um, sort, and then you can do for each element, and then you can go on and 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 if it's, there's no parallel operations available, you can now go through sequential operations. Now, I said before, not everything in parallel in, in the C++ standard library can be parallelized. That's, that's pretty obvious. We, have, we are able to do a lot of them. The most interesting one are things like for, for each, uh, find if, sort. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the parallel patterns that this enables, like, like transform and reductions. Okay? Um, 
we built two specific new ones called for each and for each n which is allow you to essentially to step through um, iteration elements using a parallel library these are fantastic I think um, and then of course there's the usual numerical ones like reductions um, whether it's um, sequential or parallel reductions we can do all of these things so these are the, the, the typical um, parallel patterns like your standard serial reduction um, capability, which you can now do fairly easily already using accumulate, student accumulate. You can do um, parallel reduction now with just essentially using a new execution policy would reduce. Okay, um, you can do a transform now, essentially transforming each element into some other particular representation. Pretty easy using the student transform, and of course you can combine them into transform and reduce at the same time. Okay, so that's really all, all that's all, all about. So here's the transform with a reduction at each particular element. And now you can do all of that stuff, okay? So C++ has finally stepped into the 20th century. C++ 17 has finally made it into the 20th century. The question is, when will it make it into the 21st century? Now, if you look at the way uh, most chips are built up, there's a lot of CPU cores and but there's this little space here that C++ still does not address, which leaves a lot of MIPS on the table. In, the, in fact, I would dare say 70% of the MIPS is still left on the table, and that's what's accessed from the GPUs. So if you could access that, then you, that would be fantastic. So that we can not just we'll distribute the workload across cores, we can also distribute the workload down to the GPU level. So how do we do that? Well. This is, I mentioned that we have this escape clause, which enables us to have a SQL execution policy, which can be added. Now you can execute thousands of elements here on the GPU instead. Okay. Now let's see how we do that. Um, so in SQL, we have implemented many of these algorithms like count if, find if, find, for each. We haven't implemented them all, but it's, it's you know, you can, once the principle is there, you can see how it can be done. But the thing you might be wondering is, what is SQL? And the, the reason I'm talking about this, even though I'm representing C++ standard in the Kronos boot, is because SQL is one of the few um, heterogeneous C++ language that starts right off from modern C++. It doesn't try to build up from C. I'm going to spare you the, 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 the advertising message and get to the fact that the idea is that SQL can build on top of many te any, any number of template libraries like TensorFlow for machine learning. Okay, and then But it, right now it uses an open seal back end to distribute down to the Jeep just because it's easy to do that but in reality this is the upper front end language you could easily use a PTX back end or, or back end specifically um, um, instrumented for a C an FPGA like Xilinx or something like that there's nothing that prevents you from doing that this just makes it fairly easy to distribute to any heterogeneous uh, devices right now so I'll show you a quick example how does it work um, this is actually a SQL, a little bit of us dive into SQL to show you how, that, how it works. I think Peter is going to give a more detailed explanation of that. So this is going to be a quick flyby. You're doing it on Wednesday? Okay, great. Um, so let's say you want to do a typical parallel add. Okay? Um, naturally, you would have an input, a, bunch, a number of input vectors and an output vector. Um, in SQL, the idea is what's called implicit data movement. You have to pack, you have to prepare the buffer for your inputs submit it to a queue okay then here's the kernel you can see right now everything here is c++ so far um, you have templates you have type names you have it's this header which brings it in nothing here is c like okay and then what happens next is this is where the magic happens where that using a dependency call graph you instruct it to which one is a read and which one is a write Okay? And the runtime will mediate getting the data to the compute node in the right time. This is really what we ask for. We don't want to be explicitly telling the system, I need the data there right now, but not before this. You really just want the system to be able to say, I want the data to be at that compute node when that compute node is ready to execute. Okay? And this is what does it. It uses all C++ syntax. Okay? And then finally, the actual kernel. Now, C++ gives you this ability where even though this looks like a library call, it's actually compiler magic. 
Okay? Exception handling is done in the same way. It's a library algorithm, but it's actually the compiler that handles it. So there's nothing odd or different here. Okay? Um, you have to name your kernel because lambdas is a um, is not a standard layout type, which means you don't. If every lambda you, has a mango name that's randomly generated, and when you, by the time you pass it from the CPU to the GPU, it's going to have a different name representation. So unless you have a handle to figure this out, you're not going to figure that. You're not going to be able to get it back. Um, what we're doing here is creating a parallel fall to define for the device code. Okay, and then there's the computation. It's fairly simple. It's exactly what you would expect. Okay, well, we just add the input vector the L and of A and B and gives you the output vector. Again, this is all just pure C++ code with namespaces, with template arguments, everything exactly as you would expect. Okay, and here's the code to call the parallel add. Very simple, in the main program, initiate your vectors, call the routine I showed you before, and off you go. All right. How do you implement this? Um, you have to create generally a sickle execution policy. You have to create type IDs and things like that. I'm going to spare you most of this stuff and have uh, Peter talk to it. What I really want to show you, though, okay, is the result. This is really why you're standing here and waiting. All right. So here's the sequential result. This is without any sequential. And this is the size of the sort algorithm and the number of elements. Okay. You see that 2 to the 16, parallel got you a little bit of speed up, but not much. Unsequence got you a little bit, and using just dispatching it. So recall, this is all on the CPU. This is going to the GPU. Okay. You notice that there's nothing much to write home about here. Anyone can tell me why? I think most people here, you probably have not have a guess. The sample size is too small. Until this thing gets big enough so that it's worth sending to the GPU, it's not going to get you much of a speed up compared to a sequential execution. Even parallelize it on the CPU doesn't get you much speed up. But look at here. At some point, I just kept pushing the boundary until this GPU was able to accept this and the overhead does not swamp it out. At 2 to the 19, you see that sequential, parallel, and parallel vectorize is almost three times, three to five times slower than what it is dispatching to the GPU. That result wowed CPPCon attendees when we showed this at the CPPCon talk about two months ago. When they looked at this, they realized the real power of the parallel algorithms. Not up here, yeah, it gives you some speed up, and you notice this, the, the result varies. In some cases, it's actually slower than the sequential. Okay? And this is because in this case, 2 to the 19 just swamps all the cores. I'm, by the way, I'm not doing this on any dedicated GPU. I'm just doing it using an Intel, an Intel Xeon 5 with a built-in GPU. This is not even with an NVIDIA or any dedicated AMD devices. I could get a lot more speed up with that. You see that the, the, the results across here is spotty at best. Some, most of the time, it seems to be faster than the sequential on the CPU. And until you get past this, um, this divide, the GPU was actually potentially slower okay, than what you might get. And it's not until you get to get a large enough data size. This is, not, this is normally how we expect things to be. And this is in, in some way, this is not a surprise that the GPU executing C++ parallel algorithm can, fastly, um, can be five times faster than the CPU. That's it. Um, C++ standard. And Kronos are both pulling together now with much greater collaborations. We're trying to drive towards more capability so that many of the things that learned out of Kronos' um, heterogeneous computing efforts with OpenCL and C++ is now driven into the C++ standard with things like executors, asynchronous algorithms, context, affinity. I just put in the affinity proposal into the C++ standard last week, and people loved it. Everyone says we desperately need this affinity support. The question is how to do it in a C++ manner using templates and containers so that an algorithm so that it works within the C++ framework. So it doesn't look like some oddity stuck out on the side. I'm not saying OpenMP is an oddity, but certainly having pragmas isn't going to work in the C++ standard in that way or, or from OpenAC or from any of these other uh, particular algorithms.
Um, and we're working on the idea of how to propose a better exception handling. I already showed you a little bit of that idea. Where instead of giving you the entire set of exceptions, we're going to give you a limited set based on this, the space that you tell us to have. Executor, this, the rest of this is about executors and how that's going to enable a call, a, a standardized call interface in C++. And all it is is saying, executors enable you to be the mediator between all these different ways of doing parallelism in C++ with all these different, potentially different resources so that you don't get an end-to-end cross-product explosion. You just get the executor, the executor allows you to query and choose the, the resource you want to execute it on. Today, you might want to do it on an OpenMP node. Tomorrow, you might want to do it on the thread pool. But you want to do a parallel algorithm on any of these. So as you can see, we're, we're, it's not there yet. And we're opening the pool so that we can get to um, that stage. Everybody is on board. The question, the only thing we're arguing on is how to get there. That makes sense. So what did we talk about? We basically talked a little bit about the history of the parallel ST, parallelism technical specification from C++. We talked about the path that takes it from a technical specification, specification to C++ 17, which will be released at the end of this year. We ratified it to a year ago. We show how the parallel STL was designed to run on a CPU, but now we with Sickle, and hopefully with future ISO C++, we can run it on GPU. And we showed some of the future directions in terms of the collaborations we do on heterogeneous and distributed computing on C++. Um, that is using learning from Kronos, from OpenMP, from Cocos, from Raja, from HPX, NVIDIA's agency from C++ AMP. We've, we've studied them all and we're trying to collate what are the best features that allows us to support that. And that, that, that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. If you guys have any questions about where we're going, thoughts, yeah, go ahead. So what is heterogeneous extensions is infinity. So what kind ah. of machine model are you using? So the question is, what is the heterogeneous extension for infinity? Yeah, the, the yeah. machine model behind it. Yeah. The machine model. Okay. So we, so in the C++ standard, you have to go slowly to, because there's so many parties. We propose, we put in a proposal for both a low-level HW lock which is, exists on many systems, as well as a higher level abstract, like the OpenMP places, where you tell us whether places represents a core, or socket, or thread. You tell us how, how fine-grained the granularity is. So the idea is that using affinity, you could imagine an offload node as just an affinity problem. How far away is it? What's the, what's the data movement policy? This is kind of the direction that I think out of the last meeting that I got from the group discussion is we don't want, now I, I sense in the room there was a group that wanted the low level interfaces because they really need to identify exactly the layout of configuration from HW log. But what's stopping us is HW log is currently really hierarchical and there's in future we don't think memory systems is going to be purely hierarchical like that. They, uh, you know. Uh, but nevertheless, for pure performance, some, some people want that H, that low level. A lot of people might not. They want the more high level abstraction so that you don't have, so that you can port programs that was uh, designed for one space to another space easily. Um, the idea now that's emerging, and I'm going to work on it now between this standard meeting and the next standard meeting, is an idea called problem space focused policy. And that's what Sickle is essentially already do, uh, embodying. We don't want to tell you to be telling us, I want this data to be moved over to this particular node at this particular time, although we think that's still doable. You might want to say, I want this data to, to move along with this compute operation, or I want these two compute operations to stay close together, or this data needs to be near that data. We think that's a more usable policy. Yeah. We haven't, I haven't designed it yet, but that's what I'm going to work on in the next three months. And if you guys want, uh, I hope people help me with this. I think there's some, I, don't, I didn't bring any of my business cards because I've been traveling for about three weeks straight. There's some of our Coldplay business cards. And I'm running this um, bi-weekly telecon uh, conference with a number of people across the labs um, and a number of companies called Heterogeneous Distributed C++ Call, where we look at things like affinity. We look at things like how to create an, a, a, a concrete context object which a lot of um, 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 languages need. We look at how to handle exception in a concurrent environment. Okay? We also have other calls that discuss uh, parallel STL when merged with ranges. 
software, the, the new way of doing iterators in C++. And this is an important area because there's going to be some parallelism and, and ordering uh, lock-free concerns in there. Because most of those components use templates. And when you do that, I have a, I'm wondering if transactional memory might come in to help with that. Because when you have templates that calls templates, a deadlock is very, very obvious, uh, obviously possible. Um, so um, I'm kind of leading the heterogeneous distributed C++ standardization effort, as well as being the chair of Sickle. And part of that is because it's helping using Sickle, but I'm not married necessarily to Sickle, even though I, I work for Codeplay. There's a lot of learning from across the national labs, across the different languages. I actually designed part, help be part of the, um, the discussion when I was in OpenMP with accelerators. So I think there's a lot of learning from all these guys that can help us to create the best um, um, acceleration support system in C++. So yes, sorry, that's a long-winded answer, but Affinity is the, is the initial way. And if we don't think Affinity, first let's get Affinity in, and then if that doesn't work for inaccessible memory, then we'll have to find another method. Okay, so that's that's a great question, actually. But there's a lot of discussion going on right now. Other questions about where heterogeneous distributed C++ standard is going? Any other thoughts? All right. Maybe another question. Sure, go ahead. Okay, so the question is: Is Vulkan potentially replacing OpenCL? Now, because I'm in Kronos, I'm not, it's not like C, ISO C++, everything's wide open. There's some IP question issues there. I think I'm at least allowed to say, because I've read enough blogs that this is not exactly a secret. Vulkan has now enough compute capability that people realize it's not just for graphics. In fact, it's actually really good for compute. So good, in fact, that people are trying to figure out how to take some of its interfaces, or maybe all of it, and moves it into the future of OpenCL. Without being specific, the, the, I think the discussions revolving around, do we just take the interface level, or indeed some of the, the, the core algorithm, um, core routines that has to do with compute capabilities, or do we merge the two completely? So, like you can see there's a lot of dimension to discuss, but people definitely realize that graphics languages absolutely can enhance compute capabilities, even though they were designed to be for graphics languages. So that's why the question you're asking has to do with, um, is there a Vulkan OpenCL convergence in the future? Um, but at what level is this convergence going to be? Okay, so that's why it's interesting. All right, I hope I haven't violated any IP, IP agreement at this point. <laughs> any other questions about, about Kronos, ISO C++, ISO C. Um, one thing I might add is that I think now as we move into the age of machine learning and self-driving cars and internet of things, um, there's going to be a, an increased emphasis for safety critical. Um, all these things that has to do with uh, self-driving cars, finance, um, medical devices that might use any number of heterogeneous C++ language or C languages, whether they're from Kronos or from ISO or some vendor proprietary language are going to need safety critical. So I'm going to leave that, leave that with you as a thought because I think that's, where we're, that's the future we're heading. Thank you very much, everybody. Cheers.